Welcome to Unlearning Ignorance, a podcast where once a month we discuss a commonly divisive issue and attempt to fairly represent multiple perspectives. We are not experts, nor are we neutral. Our goal is to show an accurate understanding of conflicting sides in hopes that it will foster civil conversations with an attitude of always learning. But we also want the show to represent you. So every month we will have a response episode where we highlight your comments, emails, tweets, and voicemails telling us what we got terribly right, incredibly wrong, or something in between. Thanks for listening to this month's episode where we bring together Vox Populi, the voice of the people. Welcome to the Unlearning Ignorance Podcast. My name is Ethan Hicks and I'm with here with my co-host, Chase Tremaine. That is How I. How you doing, Chase? I'm... <laughs> I'm doing well. I, uh, I've been wearing these uh, studio headphones a lot lately. I feel like my ears are getting smaller. Do they get sweaty? Is it like a hot kind of like, I always see everybody on the internet wearing those big studio headphones and I always think like they must like trap a lot of heat. Do my ears get hot sometimes? No, it's, it's for me, it's like, you know, you breathe out of your mouth, you breathe out of your nose. But when you take these headphones out off after wearing them for a few hours, it really feels mm-hmm. like you breathe out of your ears too. You have this, like, I can breathe again moment. Like, oh. Um, <laughs> That's what the real world feels like. Not yeah. this insulated bubble yeah. I artificially created on my ears. Everything sounded so much better in here, but I knew it was just a fantasy. <laughs> so what are we talking about today, my man? Well, today we are talking about personality tests. and You know, I'll tell you what the worst personality test is. What the, the most boxing reductionist reductionistic personality test there is Go that on. confines us all to a to a binary format uh-huh the bipartisan okay. republican and democratic politics it is the worst <laughs> the worst personality test out there so, so just like a questionnaire that gives you either a r or d at the end yeah yeah <laughs> both by which i which i think would be a failure on any yeah. test just write an l into both check boxes <laughs> where's my third party that's what's wrong it's america uh, right so uh personality tests uh yes with this being our second episode it might seem odd to follow up uh pacifism with personality tests unless we were just going in alphabetical order through our topics which we aren't um mm-hmm. all about the peas, man all about the peas. but we are uh aiming to flip back and forth between uh, more political leading topics and more uh, social leading mm-hmm. topics. Yeah. Uh, so this is the month for social, and we thought personality tests would be a great thing to talk about because there are a lot of different opinions out there, and uh, people who side so strongly with how they identify through a certain test um, that it can be a tough thing to disagree with. To say. Uh, I don't think that those tests are a good thing or I don't believe in that could be extremely offensive to someone who has their identity wrapped up in it. I find it such a weird uh, social quirk about America, at least that in casual conversation, they'll bring up, Oh yeah, I'm a, uh, an ENSP in, in, or whatever. Yeah. NSP. Eh, I'm an in, ESPN. In, <laughs> NWS. Huh. WAN. Or it, just to bring up your letters. I'm from, an NSFW. <laughs> <laughs> from your your personality test that's as a like a, a social shorthand to say this is how i view the world this is my my general personality the box that i fit into and it, it is a fascinating like to say like i think that's a, to, how offended people get when to claim that i think that's a little silly to uh to to just declare yourself that as a like this is my personality and how i view the world and oh that's just their personality and it's fine it's just that's just what they're doing they're doing what their personality test told them to do kind of thing yeah and it's you'll find with you know different people and different experiences uh which of course on this podcast we want to try to fairly represent uh the different experiences and and a broad spectrum of things is that for some people it seems more like it's it's a closing the box experience of okay like this is this is who I am this is who I'm not this is what I can do this is what I can't do 
And for other people, it's more of an opening the box experience of these personality tests being tools of self-understanding that are, that bring them to a place of, oh, I never even realized this about me. Or now I finally have uh, the model or the language with which to understand and explain something that I that used to be a mystery to me. Or mm-hmm. I used to think I was the only one. Or I didn't understand how to understand other people and how they behaved or thought. Right. So let, let's get into like what what the the major tests. So obviously the Myers Brig is the uh, one of the more the, I would I would argue the the most famous. It's the one everybody uh, copies to do their Disney uh, personality tests or their HBO Game of Thrones. Which which emperor are you? Will you be on the throne? And so there it was. It came out of like these two. Uh, these two women who had had read a lot of Carl Jung, and it really focused on uh, the the biggest division, which is introvert extrovert, and so the E and I right was the is the first letter, and they see that as the biggest division of people that all the others kind of follow, which is feeling, thinking, intuition. One of the the drawbacks of MBTI is that typically it says it's it's trying to declare this is your personality but it's found that upon retaking the test sometimes like people have dramatically different uh, outcomes and so it, it it lacks a little bit of the the spectrum nuance that some of the others might have All right so uh meyer briggs has 16 types another popular personality test that only has four is the disc assessment uh, based on the ideas of psychologists William Marston and Walter Clark. Uh, it's a behavior evaluation that's used probably most commonly in the career setting uh, for jobs in terms of uh, putting teams together or hiring staff. And DISC uh, stands for the four different types in this. Uh, so D can be like dominant, direct, demanding. These are the outgoing, task-oriented people. I uh, can stand for inspiring, influencing, inducing, and these are the outgoing, people-oriented uh, type. S stands for supportive, steady, stable, uh, sensitive. These are the reserved, people-oriented. And then C can stand for cautious, calculating, competent, compliant. These are the reserved, task-oriented people. So it's very basic as to whether you are outgoing or reserved and whether you are task-oriented or people-oriented. And this test has been adapted uh, to a lot of different ways it is described a lot as being like you are a lion otter beaver or golden retriever i was wondering uh recently if uh if the disc assessment is aligned with uh figuring out which uh hogwarts house you align in ah Um, next we have the revised neo personality inventory also known as big five is how i was first introduced introduced to it it was developed by Paul Costa and Robert McRae, and it has uh, five categories, a.k.a. Big Five. <laughs> Extroversion, conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, and openness to experience. So these, this personality test has more of a spectrum uh, view of, like, where do you fall in each of these? Are you low on the neuroticism or are you high? And it doesn't necess- it doesn't assign you letters like the M- MBTI, but it it says where in the population do you generally fall in each of these uh, traits. And one of the the criticisms of it is that it doesn't take into account maybe the the social uh, bias in that like America personality traits maybe highly culturally impacted as as pros from somebody from China, the expression of some of these traits wouldn't look like somebody from America. And so even though somebody from America and China may have similar personalities, they just express it differently in in each of these uh these categories that it, it lists out. It's my personal favorite though. And the last major test that we'll introduce for this 
podcast is the Enneagram, which has been on my radar for at least 15 years or so, but just in the past two or three years has seemed to really have an uptick in popularity. It is uh, kind of a shape-based um, model, the circle that contains a triangle and a hexagon that connects nine different personality types and how they relate to one each other and how they move um, to one another in both positive and negative ways. There are different names for the nine types. They accord with um, numbers. Uh, here's one set of how those are named. Reformers, helpers, achievers, individualists, investigators, loyalists, enthusiasts, challengers, and peacemakers. Um, and so you have uh, the number to which you're assigned to. You have a direction in which you move in a, in a healthy state where you actually start taking on aspects of another number on the Enneagram. Uh, you have a direction you move in a negative way where you begin taking on uh, the negative aspects of a different number on the Enneagram. And then a lot of people uh, will also have uh, ways in which they lean toward the number next to them on the Enneagram. A five might lean toward the four and have elements of their personality or lean heavily towards the six and those are called wings so along with people uh you know possibly saying like oh, i'm a one or i'm a nine they might say i'm a one wing nine or a nine wing one so those are four of the major personality tests there's obviously mm -hmm. plenty else out there um but we want to uh start off by discussing uh the micro side of this issue uh, specifically how specific tests are used by individuals. Mm -hmm. So kind of presenting the, the scale of uh, these issues on one side, you have uh, the view that personality tests are useful and healthy in getting to know yourself and others. And on the more negative side of the spectrum, that personality tests are reductionistic by nature and they put people into boxes. Yeah. So really looking at the individual use, the, the re, essentially the relationship between the person and the test. The, how they, if you take the test, how are you taking it? How, how is it, how are you processing it? Are you, do you find the benefits of uh, it revealing these, uh, these other sides of you? Or do you see it as more like, oh, this is now how I act? Are you using it as like the end all be all of like oh this is this is just who I am and I don't have to worry about growing or changing. And so to add a little bit of nuance uh, to those two sides, uh, it, it is not generally speaking true that most people are either against all personality tests or for all personality tests. Even during the introduction of the four main ones, you mentioned that the Big Five was your favorite. Mm -hmm. um, there are some people who might be adamant defenders of one and, you know, big critics of another. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, I mean, like you said, case in point is me, which I like the big five, and I'm highly critical of the MBTI, which I see as, like, putting the, the negative, the putting people in boxes and pitting them against each other kind of thing. Right, and on that note, uh, we are going to begin a bit of discussion with you taking uh, the anti-side mm -hmm. of uh, coming more from the perspective of putting people in boxes, right. and I'll be coming more from the positive side of, kind of like I said earlier, opening the box for people. So, on a pro side, I, I think personality tests flow out of just the way that humans deal with the world in general. We work in categories. We work in, you know, piecing things together in models and systems and groupings that make sense to us. So we have, you know, our, you know, wheat food items and our dairy food items. We have our fruits and our vegetables. We have our good days and our bad days. We have our winter clothes and our summer clothes. We have mm -hmm. our people we like and people we don't like. Uh, we have the movies that we watch when we're sad and the movies that we watch when we invite friends over. Um, all of these come out of the ways in which humans make sense of the world. But one of the most complex things in the world 
is like humans ourselves. We have a lot of trouble understanding ourselves and one another. And sometimes we get lost in our assumptions of self-awareness to think that we know ourselves well. And even to an extent where we might favor how we are, how we behave, how we think over what we perceive from other people. And so uh, we begin to take a flawed version of self-awareness and impose that upon other people to say, you know, if we like something about ourselves and other people are different or don't match up, then that's ne- a negative thing on them. And if people are there things that we don't like about ourselves, um, then uh, other people who are doing what we want or think is right or think is better, um, then that's a good thing. And what these personality tests can do, especially when you get deeper into uh, your knowledge of them, is uh, provide ways of saying like, hey, this person's brain works in a way that mine doesn't. And this personality test helps me to explain the ways in which they're thinking that doesn't compute to me, the ways in which like they're looking at a problem at work and coming up with a solution that I never could have thought of. Uh, or the way that uh, they are communicating in small talk with strangers in a way that makes me really uncomfortable. And it, it, I could come up with you know thousands of ways in which humans think and behave and feel differently. And a good personality test uh, puts words to that in a way that actually makes sense of people and ourselves rather than um, writing them off as, oh, they're just a six or, oh, they're just an INFJ. Right. And so I'm going to take that, that thought process you were saying that that's what they're actually doing. It's not being used to say, oh, this explains it. It's being used to d- dismiss. It's being used as like, oh, you just think that because you're an extrovert. Like, that's just who you are and how you feel. And you are, you don't, I don't have to understand you because I understand this term. I don't have to see you as an individual because I can dismiss you as a group. And they, these tests can, can really reinforce you like bad personality traits so just because you get a an eye on your mbti it's like oh man i am an introvert and i i'm just gonna like i don't have to go see people i don't have to go see people ever because this is who i this is who i am i don't have to reach out to people i don't have to expand socially because i'm an introvert i i don't need that i don't need that to be more personal, to come out of my bubble. Or I'm an extrovert. I don't have to recharge by being alone because that's who I am. I can dismiss an interaction with a, a poor interaction between me, an extrovert, and you, an introvert, because, oh, you're just an introvert. We're never going to we're never gonna socially agree. And so I don't have to uh, bend, bend my or curtail my extrovert because that's who I am. And why are you going to deny who I am? So these, these tests put names to your, the things you do. Uh, I, I'm, I'm high on eroticism. And, and they can use that. You can use that as this is who I am. Like, I don't need to improve on my neuroticism. I don't need to... I don't need to be better because everybody should just accept me for who I am. It's it's a snapshot. Uh, the same way that Insta like let's let's take this to Instagram. So Instagram gives a snapshot of people's lives. Generally, people who Photoshop it or using it to take a snapshot of their their best best time and best personality. Uh, and so this snapshot of your personality can lead you to cling to it and to cling to that image and say, this is what I'm pursuing. I don't need to pursue any other 
self-building, self-reflecting characteristics because this is just who I am. And I don't have to worry about self-growth and development because you're because you have this test that told you who you are. So in general, it can lead you to say these are this snapshot are is a rock solid assessment of who you are and that you were and that people can tend to overgeneralize it and say, oh, I can understand how I was across my whole life, whereas as I brought up in MBTIs you you can be different persons throughout your life. You can have those different personality labels throughout your life. And if you're trying to use a label to look back and say, oh, I did this uh, because I was this personality label, you may have had a different personality. And it will give you a flawed reflection on what that personality test is trying to communicate to you. So what if those things, some of those things are accurate, though? Like, what if someone tests as an I, and it's true that too much social engagement, too much meeting strangers, uh, too many attempts at small talk could, like, lead them into, like, breakdowns or depression? Uh -huh. You know, or what if it's true that, like, someone tests as an E, and for them trying to force... You know, like reserved alone time, you know, just feels like a waste that or isolated. They're just yeah, right. They feel so, like separated. They feel like they're just like twiddling their fingers. A clock is right. A broken clock is right twice a day. Right. <laughs> so a broken test, a flawed view of the world, a a static view of the world can be right infrequently it can have these these very true very what you described very accurate assessments of somebody at one point in time or somebody behaving a certain way but the idea of most of these tests are that this is who you are this is how the company should interact with you this is what you bring to the table without the idea that maybe Two weeks from now, maybe you've grown in a certain area, and one of your uh, one of your tests will say something else. Sure. And so, it is very it is a static image that people are trying to treat as a video of their life. The smallest minority is the individual. Say you are an extrovert. Extroverts look different between each individual. So everybody has a different expression of their extrovertedness. And so extroversion. some people's yeah, and some people's extroversion in America looks different in China and vice versa. So I will side with you that a lot of personality tests or the usage of them can be too static. And even, you know, I'm looking at a chart right now for disk and I can see words on each part of the chart that I relate to or identify with or have seen in my life, you know, like demanding, interactive, supportive, sensitive, uh, competent, cautious, like those, there are things all over that chart that I'm like, but that's me. You know, I can be both task oriented and people oriented. I can be both reserved and outgoing. So to say that I'm just one of those. Uh, does seem limiting and missing the point and missing the complexity of every single human being. To say that I'm one of those most often could potentially be more accurate. Something that I think becomes very useful when you get to know these tests much better is that most of them have motion. Most of them have fluidity. Most of them have spectrums. And most of them have things going on beneath the surface. Uh, Meyer Briggs, for example, uh, looks on the outset like you're just one or the other. You're a J or you're a P. You're an E or you're an I. I actually will switch back and forth between testing as an INTJ and an INTP 
because on the JP spectrum, I land so close to the middle that it could fall either direction on any given day. Similarly, the Enneagram uh, recognizes that you could have kind of different numbers in who you are. That, you know, Enneagram proponents will say that the nine altogether basically covers the whole of different ways that humans feel, think, and act. But that doesn't mean you're stuck in a place. And one Mm -hmm. of my favorite things about the Enneagram is the way that it sees movement from a number one number to another it says that you know a someone who is a three will start taking on the healthy aspects of a six when they themselves are in a healthy spot yeah and i i can i can totally see the uh, and i will concede that these tests are an awesome just introductory way to looking at your psychology to looking at the psychology of other people Mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't take college level introductory uh intro psych classes like even though it is a very young science it's very useful to understand how the categorically your brain is generally working in relation to other people and and that yes you are an individual and you have this spectrum of emotions and spectrum of ways you interact with other people. But on a general level, it helps to understand, oh, people have generally acted one way or another, and I'm not alone in this <laughs> this world and how I've reacted to this situation. There are other people who share my reaction. And I think that's a good uh, pivot to talk about the more macro uh, idea of how people are using these tests agreed uh and into how are we using them uh to group ourselves and- or, or or to say how are these personality tests used on societal levels and specifically yes. what is what is the big picture place of personality tests in our american culture so from a macro level as in a a societal level, how do we use these personality tests? How how is a person to person in American society interaction using these tests on an interpersonal level and a broader scale? Are are we using them in a way that is like useful for building community and uh, bonding between it, or is it more like tribalistic? my because I, this because this is my label because this is my neuroticism or extroversion this is how this is the better way of viewing the world this is the group that should run the world because we know best and so i'll i'll be arguing for the the usefulness and the uh camaraderie that these these labels bring that be, just because you have that, just because the test gave you this label based on how you answered it, it's a, uh, it's, it adds just another dimension to that personality trait to bond with somebody over, over that personality to, re, to realize, oh, there's other parts of my personality that contributed to this, and they're highly reflected in this other person, and that bond over we see the world the same way is just it is so impactful in 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 mental health and feeling understood in the world so i'm going to take the anti side um and say that uh as as a society uh these personality tests are harmful i think we already have a big enough problem with people sectioning off and getting into groups and bubbles and echo chambers and doing that based on the things that they have in common, uh, whether it's common interests or common enemies. If you look at Meyer Briggs, for example, 16 types, that doesn't mean that, you know, our society is split evenly between like 6% of each type. The, if I remember correctly, the rarest type is INFJ, which has like 1% 
I think, supposedly, of our society. And that also happens to be the uh, the Meyer Briggs type that most that I see most frequently forming like groups of like like here's a here's a subreddit or here's a Facebook group message or here's like a little club. Um, and I I don't think uh, that's healthy. I don't think it's it's good for society as a whole to um, do that, especially if something like you're the rarest Meyer Briggs type. So there's something like a, uh, a superiority there or like, mm. a ra- we are rare. We are, we are special. Okay. We're going okay. to band together in that. And while it might work uh, at times to say like, I just found out my neighbor is, um, you know, ENF- ENFP. And I knew nothing about them before, and now I have a starting place. Now I can uh, begin to go at them and talk to them in a certain way. I think it's much more common for us to be like, oh, like that's just how that kind of person works. Oh, they are just being so seven right now. Or I don't really get along with ones. Um, I think that is the more common effect that personality tests have on people. And... I just don't see the helpfulness of that. I'll just address the INFJ because I, I see them too. And what you're seeing as like, oh, we're we're superior, uh, I, I think can be seen at, it can be maybe more accurately interpreted as other people around me don't see this way. And so there are people not physically near me, uh, but on the internet, which I can connect with, who see the world in the other way. And Mm. so to have that affirmation and that sense of community in a very fractured world, just just think about, do you know physically your neighbors? Like, uh, I heard it described as like, there's uh, there's circles of neighbors physically near you. How many of them do you know? Like, me personally, I know maybe one of my immediate immediately physically close to me neighbors but three uh two or three scales out from me in a physical space i know way more people because i because we have common places we go and they're further away and so that we're we're desperate for that sense of community that will, will drive so many distances so physically around these infjs there may not be a lot of those people, even it within those like degrees of separation physically, but on the internet, they're right there, and so that they can bond over that and understand them themselves more because they're seeing more of them of people who see the view, world. They they see it, and so they can better reflect on how they see the world because other people they're bonding with see it similarly, and so they can be more comfortable and have more confidence with themselves. So I think the internet is an interesting thing to bring up in this discussion because the internet is already a place so prone to reductionism that we get reduced to our about section on Facebook. We get reduced to our Instagram feeds. We get reduced to numbers of likes and hearts and friends. And I think that the common modern usage of these personality tests it just fits in with a society where people know each other less and less and people get personal and deep less and less mm. and where it's already so hard to know people on a on a deep level and to have these strong face-to-face interpersonal relationships um that having these buckets to place people in i think it just it it makes sense that personality tests would become so popular again in the internet age um, because it just it just fits in with um, a desire to over categorize to make mm, things easier okay. and to make relationships simpler right this might be a perception problem in that the things that get promoted more frequently on the internet or the things that go quote vi- quote unquote viral they those are the 
the the extremes of everything. The the small extremes go viral because they evoke the strongest negative emotions from one side. And so the positive emotions of people bonding over INFJ, nobody, none of those go viral, even though they are they would be much more frequent of the interactions. It's the the extreme negative that gets shared by everybody because hate is the biggest hate and disgust is one of the biggest drivers for sharing for somebody sharing on the internet. Sure, I think I'm fine with wrapping up the macro conversation there. And of yeah. course, uh, when Ethan and I take these uh, pro and anti sides, we aren't necessarily discussing things from the positions we actually hold. Um. So I'd, I'd like to share one quick story uh, about uh, so some of my experiences in preparing for this episode. I've, I find myself increasingly surrounded uh, by people who really love using the Enneagram. And so that was my main point of study in preparing for this episode. And something I was uh, pleasingly shocked to discover about that model is that it's not just about like the things that make you great, the things that make you unique, the things that make you different. It's not it's not like the strength finder test. Where it's like here are all these things you're good at. Uh, the enneagram is is so much about like who are you at your worst? Like wh- what's your starting point at your most like base level? Like with zero growth, um, none of your like good developed traits over time. Like, who are you when you're angry, when you're sad, when you're depressed? Um, And so a lot about, like, finding your number is that. And um, I'm still uh, learning about the Enneagram and and still not convinced of its um, legitimacy as a model. Uh, But in this uh, research process, I've come to find that I'm probably either a three or a four. specifically probably either a three wing four or four wing three and by viewing myself in the model of a three some things that are true about threes rang totally hollow for me but some things about threes actually gave me like self-revelation that i wasn't um almost like wasn't prepared for um i've always considered myself to be not a competitive person but most of that came from me not liking sports and being athletic. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm not competitive at all in like soccer or ultimate frisbee or whatever. In the popular ways of yeah, because conceptualizing competitive. Be, well, because I know not to be competitive there because I know that I'll lose. <laughs> um, but when it comes to like being the best problem solver at the office or being the smartest person in the room or being mm. like the most talented uh, musician at a concert, I'm wildly competitive. Um, and another thing uh, that I read about threes that I now see to be like stupidly, almost embarrassingly true about myself is that they can be so um, focused on their accomplishments and their achievements that during conversations with people um they'll usually be like half divided like on like yeah i'm kind of listening and i'm paying attention and i care about you but i'm also worrying about this project that i need to get home and finish and i'm thinking of ways that i can uh solve a complex issue when i get back to the office on monday and then this there's kind of like a more even devious form of that of i'm only caring about the people that i see as a, an advantage like, I'm not really trying to be buddy-buddy with the people who are uh, on my level of the totem pole or beneath me. I'm caring about being buddy-buddy with the people that I think can get me somewhere. Mm. Um, and that's something that, like, I now see to be true about me. And it's because I attempted viewing myself uh, through the lens of being a three on the Enneagram. Okay. I can appreciate that. Thank you for listening to this month's episode, but the conversation isn't over yet. We want to hear from you. What did we get right or wrong, and what's your perspective on the issue? 
By writing in, your feedback can be featured in the response episode we will publish later this month. Email us at unlearningignorance at gmail.com, tweet us at unignorancepod, or leave a voicemail at 972-885-9574. Again, that's 972-885-9574. And by lending your voice to the conversation, you can help this podcast represent the Vox Populi, the voice of the people. Thanks for tuning in to Unlearning Ignorance, and we'll be back next month with another divisively divisive issue.